Welcome to the last session of today for the conference Capitalizing Power. The session is called Power from Above, Power from Below. There are two presenters. One is Tim DiMuzio on the plutonomy, the plutonomy of the 1%. And the other one will be uh, no, called No Way Out, Crime, Punishment, and the Limits of Power by Jonathan Nitzen and Shimshun Bichler. Now, given that Shimshun isn't here, Jonathan will take over his part and therefore <laughs> uh, talk a little bit longer, like 15 to 20 minutes. But that's not Sneaky. a problem because it's Sneaky the last Jonathan. session, so we will have the usual 20 minutes for discussion. So, Tim DeMuzio, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to take a minute at the outset and just thank our organizers. I know how hard uh, they've worked to get this off the ground, and it's really nice to be brought together uh, in this forum to have these discussions and uh, these debates. So David, James, and Troy, I don't know where you all are. There's Troy. Uh, could we give them a round of applause, please? Thank you very much. Um, the next thing I should say is uh, the topic of my presentation is the plutonomy of the 1%, differential consumption in the new Gilded Age. Uh, I, for me, this is a really fun paper, and I hope for you it's going to be uh, a little bit of a fun paper. But it is preliminary. It's part of research that I'm doing uh, for a book called The Global Political Economy of the 1%. Um, and basically, the incitement for it was the Occupy Wall Street movement and their kind of political sloganeering of the 1% versus the 99%. And I thought this was a nice way to represent uh, what might be going on in the global political economy. But at the same time, this idea of the 1%, this elite or the global rich and so on and so forth, is kind of arbitrary, as we'll see in a minute. And we'll see that the statistics are actually more alarming on how uh, concentrated wealth is, if you like. Um, the argument I'm going to try to make to you today by relying a little bit on a study from Citigroup in 2005-06 uh, uh, called The Plutonomy, uh, Buying Luxury and uh, Explaining Imbalances. By using this kind of study, I'm tr going to try to make the argument uh, to you that the capitalist power framework should not just be concerned uh, with differential accumulation, but also what I call differential conspicuous consumption, and uh, obviously uh, borrowing from Veblen's idea in the theory of the leisure class. Now, to do so uh, is not only to suggest that the accumulation of money represents the symbolic power of capitalists to shape and reshape social reproduction, but to understand how the extremely wealthy manifest their differential power through their consumptive practices. Now, what I mean by differential conspicuous consumption is a habit of thought as well as a series of consumptive practices that not only aim to set the rich apart from the non-rich, but more importantly from those in their immediate peer group. So that's the argument in a nutshell, but it's not just about the rich going shopping. We will go shopping in a minute, but it's not just about the rich going shopping. It's about them creating a separate world. So this slogan of the left, another world is possible, the rich have really taken this on seriously, and they've essentially built their own uh, economy, if you like. Uh, so what's at stake in this? I think Jeffrey Herod uh, touched upon this a little bit uh, this morning. And if you look at the international political economy literature, uh, which is the literature I primarily engage, there's talk of elites, globalizing elites, transnational business class, dominant capital, so on and so forth. And whilst these abstractions are great heuristics and they've taught us a lot, I think it's still, capital and the ruling class is still very much a black box. I'm not going to open the black box fully for you today, but I am going to suggest that we can get a little peek inside by concentrating or looking at uh, what bankers call high net worth individuals, okay? So the agenda, is as follows, I'm going to talk very briefly about the real 1%. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to the plutonomy machine. Uh, this is a phrase used in the study by Citigroup, welcome to the plutonomy machine. It's obviously a homage to uh, Pink Floyd, although they <laughs> apparently don't know uh, or are unaware of Pink Floyd's kind of radical message in that song, Welcome to the Machine. And then we'll talk about differential uh, conspicuous consumption. We'll look at some examples. Uh, and I'll ask, you know, where does this leave us? So what are some of the implications for the analysis? Again, it's very, very preliminary stuff, um, but at the same time, I hope uh, it's uh, somewhat revealing and informative for you. 
So the real 1%, here's kind of what's interesting. When I started to think about how Occupy Wall Street was using this, uh, I started thinking about, okay, well, global income equality, and, and if we apply the 1% at the global level, what does that actually look like? Uh, so we have a population of 7 billion people, right? And if you look at uh, income, if you cut it off at 47,500 yearly, if you make that, you're in the global 1%. So there is a hierarchy, of course, of wealth and income. But there's, as we'll see, hierarchies within hierarchies. Interestingly enough, if you are one of the humans on this planet lucky enough to make $35,000 a year, you're still in the top 5%. Again, this is globally uh, with a population base of 7%, and that's pro or 7 billion. And that's not surprising because we know that most of the world lives uh, on $2 a day or less. Right? So already, if you are in this position from a global perspective, uh, you're in a privileged position. This is what I call the real 1%. And I use data from the Global Wealth Report. The report began in 2007 by Merrill Lynch, and they've reported every year since. So they say, look, we're going to create this category called high net worth individuals because these are the ones that we want to attract. These are the ones who are going to be doing the investments. And they say that there's 10.9 million of them. And their definition of a high net worth individual is someone who has at least $1 million in investable assets. Okay? So minus their house. We're not talking about net worth here. Uh, then, of course, comes along another category ultra high net worth individuals. These are people who have $30 million, minimum $30 million in investable assets. 2012, they had to invent a new category, or they invented a new category, they didn't have to, called centimillionaires. These are people who have $100 million in investable assets or more. Then if we look at the billionaires, there's only 1,226 of them, according to Forbes, recent data from Forbes. And then if we look at the top seven billionaires, we use a cutoff of $30 billion, we get a very, very, very small percentage. So the real 1% is actually 0.002% if we consider all of the high net worth individuals in the world, which again is about 10.9 million people. OK, the other interesting thing uh, I want to discusses very briefly is when I saw this, when I uh, did this little pyramid, uh, I was reminded of Brodell and Brodell's uh, notion that, you know, is it a law of history? Could we say it's a law of history that the rich uh, or the wealthy are always so few, regardless of the historical epoch? And he says this, conspicuous at the top of the pyramid is a handful of privileged people. Everything invariably falls into the lap of this tiny elite power, wealth, and a large share of surplus production. Is there not, in short, whatever the society and whatever the period, an insidious law giving power to the few, an irritating law, it must be said, since the reasons for it are not obvious. And yet this is a stubborn fact taunting us at every turn. We cannot argue with it. All evidence agrees. Now, just to give you a very brief example of what Brodel is trying to suggest here, because part of the suggestion is wealth begets wealth. So once you have it, it's very difficult to lose it. So let's imagine we have $1 billion in investable wealth. $1 billion in investable wealth. Now, um, if we make 5% return on our investment, 5% return, which any schmuck can get, you know, if your investment uh, manager is getting you 5%, you ought to look into a new one. You would have to spend $137,000 every single day of every year in order to deaccumulate money, to lose money. If you re reinvested the $50 million that you would have made that year by doing absolutely nothing, right, you would have to spend the next year $144,000 dollars every single day of every single year. So this whole philanthropy business that we're hearing about, you know, the wealthy giving their money away, this kind of puts this in context a little bit. So welcome to the plutonomy machine. Again, a study by uh, Citigroup done in 2005 and updated in, in 2006. And they have a, a fairly simple thesis. It's, it's twofold argument. The first is that we can categorize the world as divided into two types of countries. One, plutonomies. The other, the rest, where we have kind of more egalitarianism. 
The other argument is that the rich are getting richer, and they're going to go on getting richer. So those are the two very simple premises or arguments made uh, in this report. Now, the evidence for their plutonomies, and these are economies that are driven by the consumption of the extremely wealthy, what I would call the real 1%. Their evidence is that the top 1% of households in plutonomies, that is Canada, Australia, the United States, and the UK, are giving an, getting an ever greater share of the national income pie. And they're not just saving it. So they're not just putting it in investments to generate ever more money. They're also spending a lot of this, and they're driving the economies. That's the argument made uh, in this study. Uh, so they say, OK, well, if we know this, let's have an equity strategy based upon this information. And their equity strategy is to buy shares in companies that make toys that the plutonomists enjoy. So what they do is they create a basket of goods that only really rich people consume. Uh, and they look at those companies that are in charge of, or in control of producing those goods and services, and put that stock in their index. So what they find, going back to 1985, is that it outperformed uh, a global index, the MSCI AAC World, by 6.8% a year. So if you had invested in just that basket of luxury stocks, or luxury companies, you would have uh, done fairly well. And yearly, your annualized returns would have been 17.8%. Okay. So this is somewhat uh, interesting to me. But I think there's a lot more evidence as well, not necessarily for plutonomies, but for, again, looking at differential conspicuous consumption. So, some of you probably have seen this. This was created in 1994. It's called How to Spend It. It's a, originally, it was a supplement in the Financial Times. But now, it's a website as of 2009. And it's also, a, of course, still a supplement in the Financial Times. It is the destination for an exclusive and affluent audience. It basically is informing you know, rich people on how they ought to consume and what's the best of the best. Right? Uh, lots of debate about this. There's other exclusive magazines for the wealthy, uh, Worth and Rob Report. Some of you have probably never heard of these magazines before. There's good reason for it. Uh, you know, there's only about 100,000 subscribers in the world to these magazines. But it gives them investment advice. It uh, gives them, again, consumptive advice. What are the best yachts? What are the best pens that people are buying? Watches, you name it. Luxury vac uh, vacation destinations, uh, real estate, and so on. Uh, there's also, I don't know how many of us know about this in the room, uh, it's called the Cost of Living Well Index, and Forbes keeps this, and it's a list of 40 goods and services that are essentially reserved to the very rich customers. So they basically track this over time, here it's since uh, 1976, and we see that the rate of inflation is actually quite high relative to a normal kind of consumer price index, right? And their suggestion why this is so is that the luxury goods that the rich consume are what they call Giffen goods. And that is essentially goods that the more pricier they are, the more expensive they are, the more the rich want them, and the more demand increases for them. So I'll give you an example of what's on this cost of living extremely well index. Uh, a coat, natural Russian sable coat, $240,000. That's up by 20% from last year. Uh, there is. Airplanes, of course, a Learjet. You know, if you're in that extremely high net worth individual class, you might have a Learjet. Uh, that's 10.6 million. Helicopter is on the uh, cost of living extremely well. Uh, that's 14.8 million if you want to buy your own personal helicopter, and so on. Uh, so this is, again, um, fairly interesting stuff, at least to my mind, um, and speaks to this 1% and eventually differential con uh, conspicuous consumption. Um, this right now is the world's largest luxury yacht. It's owned by Roman Abramovich. Um, paid 1.1 billion, that's estimated for it. And uh, it just outbeat uh, the ruler of Dubai's yacht by about 50 feet. The uh, yacht here, called the Eclipse, has two helicopter pads, 24 guest cabins, two swimming pools, several hot tubs, and a disco hall. It is also equipped with three launch boats and a mini submarine. Uh, 
that is capable of submerging to 50 meters, approximately 70 crew members are needed to operate the yacht. And it has this crazy security system as well, which I won't get into, uh, with its own private missiles and sensors and so on and so forth uh, to deflect paparazzi. Now, uh, it's not just about yacht envy here, right? We're not just talking about you know, how the rich manifest uh, their symbolic power in con their consumptive practices in regards to yachts. Uh, if we want to move from yacht envy, we can move now to submarine envy, which is the latest thing. Now, already there are about, and many of us might not know this, uh, there's about 100 private submarines floating around the world's oceans or cruising around the world's oceans. But this is the latest one. This is what, uh, you know, what could be called the benchmark for um, the uh, submarine. This is the Phoenix 1000. I'll just read you a very brief clip from its manufacturer, US Submarines. Clearly, the Phoenix provides its owner with substantially more capability than a simple yacht, the opportunity to explore the depths of the world's ocean in perfect comfort and safety. The Phoenix is capable of making transatlantic crossings at 16 knots, yet can dive along the route and explore the continental margins of some of the most fascinating waters on Earth. And unlike surface yachts, when the water gets rough, the submarine can submerge into perfectly smooth and quiet environment, continuing on towards its destination, providing a ride unsurpassed in quality unequaled by the finest motor coach or the most luxurious executive aircraft. So again, the next thing uh, in consumptive practices for the uh, high net worth individuals. Um, there's other things that are very interesting to look at, such as associations and clubs that the rich form and belong to. Uh, Met Circle Networking is one of the most exclusive, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, it's got only about 100 members, and the cutoff to join is that you have to have $100 million in net worth. So it's a very, very exclusive club, uh, networking club for the global, um, very small portion of the wealthy. Uh, I won't say too much more about it, um, just to save time. Uh, here's some other goods that are interesting to look at when we consider differential um, conspicuous consumption. Uh, the pens, the jewel encrusted pens, uh, at, or pen rather, at the top right hand corner of your screen. Anyone want to give me a guess how much that costs? It's a Mont Blanc pen. Herman, give me a guess. <laughs> That's a little much, but uh, 736000 $736,000 for a pen that's jewel encrusted. The watch here, Rolex is out. That's no longer the benchmark for telling time. You have to have a Frank Mueller. That's $700,000 right there. Very exclusive, hard to get. And then at the bottom here, we have a martini, which you can buy at the Algonquin Hotel in Manhattan. It's called Martini on a Rock. That's because there's a diamond at the bottom of it and it costs $10,000. The other thing we could look at is how the rich purchase real estate and set up their built environments. So you've probably read that Larry Ellison, the founder of Oracle, uh, has bought now 98% of the island of Lanai in Hawaii. So uh, that's eight, 88,000 acres of land, including 600, uh, a 600 acre residential development, a solar farm, parks, and utilities. Uh, but what's interesting to my mind is not just the buying of islands, but how the rich are competitively consuming housing arrangements. Uh, what you see here is the house of Mukesh Ambani, who is uh, basically the head of Reliance Group in India, uh, kind of a minerals and, and oil and gas mogul. Uh, it's the most expensive home in the world. First billion dollar home, the estimated cost of it, uh, or retail value actually now, is $2 billion. It's in Mumbai. And basically, it's 27 stories. It has three helipads, a health club, dance studio, 50 seat movie theater, an underground parking with enough room for 160 cars. Right? And the house is rumored to have about 600 people on staff at any one time. Now, if you have a house like this, you might be worried about security. And again, part of my argument is that the rich are building a different economy. They don't live in the world we live in. That's essentially my point. 
And if you have a house like this, you ought to have decent security. Safe is one of those companies that provides security for the ultra wealthy. Uh, their latest project was $10 million. They didn't release who they did it for. But when asked, what would you get for $10 million? How would you secure someone? They said this, it would be full life support systems that would keep these people and sustain them for generations, even if they were the last two people on Earth. So think of a bomb shelter with all kinds of luxuries and food and so on and so forth, uh, their own private oxygen systems and so on and so forth. Uh, this is another example. There's, I wanted to do a whole segment on how the rich secure themselves. Um, but this is, again, just a, a kind of a tasting menu, if you like, or sampling. Uh, here is one way to secure your home. Uh, it's a series of 15 shotguns. And basically, it's embedded in your ceiling or into uh, your walls so that if you're invaded or you have an intruder, you can re remotely kind of set off these shotguns uh, to kill your intruder or, or invader, right? So those are hidden in the walls of the rich. Thanks, Elf. Um, OK, so where does this leave us? Again, we've been on a, a little bit of a, an adventure. Um, but in all seriousness, um, we're talking about radically different and qualitatively uh, different social conditions uh, of existence. And I think um, you know, this, one, this 0.002% of high net worth individuals, this 10.9 million people on the planet, have really built uh, their own economy. They have their own goods. They have their own services. They have their own financial networks and advisors. They have their own elite personal networks. They have their own transportation networks. You know, my students, when they, they get on a plane, go overseas from Australia, they get to first class, and they think those people are rich sitting in first class. That's not rich. Rich is you will never step foot on one of these planes. You either own a Learjet or you have fractional ownership over one. So they have their own transportation networks, their own built environments, and their own security arrangements. It's what Frank in the Wall from the Wall Street Journal called Richistan. And now if current trends continue, we can anticipate that this group of people will continue to have a ma and maintain an interest in the social reproduction uh, of differential accumulation based primarily on sabotaging human potential uh, and creativity. And I think there's something a little bit more ominous here that relates to the research that I normally really do, which is on energy and the global political economy. One of the things that the report noted was that, look, we're in the era of high energy prices. Oil prices are likely not to come down. Therefore, we're in a fundamentally new economy. And this hurts everybody whose wages don't increase very often. You know, don't get a pay rise when oil prices increase. But the rich don't care. They can go on consuming it. It doesn't matter uh, to them whatsoever. And so what's interesting to me and what I think is more ominous about this is that now that we are in an era of high oil prices and recessionary conditions, and if this continues, uh, what will essentially happen uh, to those people who are not in the real 1%? Thank you. All right. Uh, you all should have a handout of the charts that I'm going to present, so it will be easier for you to see the fine print, which might not be visible from a distance. Uh, I'll try to make it as big as I can. I actually uh, would like to uh, talk today about will current trends continue, uh, which is uh, the projection that Tim made if current trends continue. Uh, and uh, this is work in progress, uh, as you can see, uh, as usual, by uh, Shimshon and myself. In uh, May of 2011, the Supreme Court of, Ca of uh, the United States <coughs> dictated that the state of California has to release about 30 to 40,000 inmates out of a uh, inmate population of about 145,000. So uh, that's about a third, or sorry, a fourth of the inmate population. 
Now, this decision was, in a sense, inevitable because for the previous uh, two decades, California, along with many other states in the US, uh, has gone tough on crime. And uh, it enacted, again, along with many other states, the so-called uh, three strikes law, which means that uh, offender is caught for the third time, spend the rest of their life in prison. Uh, it also went into a so-called war on drugs. And of course, the result is massive overcrowding in the jails and prisons. Uh, the jails and prisons are overflowing at about twice their design capacity. Uh, at this point, the US Supreme Court wonders if this situation is tenable. And it announces that actually it is unconstitutional. Now, in many respects, the United States today is the largest liberal penal colony in the world. Uh, it has a correctional population of over 7 million people. So that is made up of about 2 million plus in jail or in prison, plus about seven, uh, 5 million people who are either on probation uh, or on parole. And this is in a country where uh, people uh, are projecting it as the liberal model of the world. It's the world's largest free market, it's ostensibly the most prosperous, which intuitively would be surprising for many people who associate crime with poverty, with deprivation, uh, with usually third world conditions rather than first world conditions. So it, we usually do not associate pro uh, prosperity with uh, crime and punishment. We associate uh, deprivation and poverty. And I think the reason for this uh, association is the usual bifurcation that exists in political economy between production and state or between capital and power. Now, if we take the different approach that capital is power and that capitalism is uh, not a mode of production and consumption, but a mode of power, uh, the surprise becomes something quite obvious because capitalization actually discounts and commodifies power. And power is uh, eliciting, by definition, resistance. Power is meaningful against resistance. And I would argue that uh, crime is a form of resistance against power. And punishment is a way of containing crime from actually destabilizing the system of capital as power. So from that perspective, there's really nothing very surprising about seeing the world leading liberal economy being also the world's leading penal colony. Now, the purpose of my presentation today is to try to put this uh, question of crime and punishment and uh, put it in the context of capitalist power, and specifically in relation to the limits of capital as power. And this presentation is, in some sense, following up on previous two presentations uh, in the forums on capital as power that we have held here at York. In 2010, uh, I presented our work on systemic crisis and in systemic fear, in which I argued that the present crisis is really not a regular crisis. It's not about uh, production or employment or even about profit. Uh, it is about the survival of capitalism and that dominant capital and capitalists more generally are concerned not really with the fluctuations of the various magnitudes in the system. They are concerned with whether this system is going to actually continue. The next year, in 2011, I went on to articulate what we thought were the objective reasons why the ruling class and dominant capital are so fearful. In other words, it's not just a psychological uh, quirk. It's not just a, an occasional uh, 
uh, movement of the animal spirits is something anchored in some deterministic uh, trends. And what I have done is to show that if you look at the distribution of income and assets, which in our view measure the distribution of power, you can see that the ruling class is pushing against the limits of power, the class limits of power. And we went uh, all the way from the aggregate indicators of the national accounts down to the disaggregate indicators of differential accumulation by dominant capital. And in every case, we saw that uh, the rulers are pushing against their class limits. What I'd like to do today in continuation of these presentations is to examine some of the uh, darker sides of this resistance. Uh, in the past, resistance was often anchored in production because capitalism was viewed as a system of production and consumption. And therefore, when we speak about resistance, we are conjuring up in our imagination uh, mass movements, uh, strikes, political mobilization, political parties that organize the workers, and so on. Uh, but the world is changing, and there are new forms of resistance or old forms of resistance that have become actually quite important and they are worth investigating. And one of them has to do with crime and punishment. So this is where I connect to the previous uh, presentation last year. And we ended that presentation with two figures that I'm going to reproduce here with minor changes to kickstart the discussion. The first um, figure shows you the income share of the top 10% of the US population. And uh, this measure incorporates the uh, ruling class and dominant capital, but it incorporates more than that. It also incorporates the power belt, the thick power belt that surrounds the ruling class and protects it against the underlying population. So it's a broad measure that extends beyond the ruling class, but it's very much a measure that uh, tells us something about the power of that ruling class. And what this chart suggests is a very pronounced uh, U-shape historical form of distribution. And the two extreme uh, situations are highlighted, or rather than, sh rather than that, shaded in gray in the chart. And we can see that both in the 1930s and over the past decade or so, uh, the ruling class was pushing against its asymptotes of power in the sense that the distribution of income has reached uh, unequal extremes. Now, in the 1930s, pushing those asymptotes eventually triggered a systemic uh, crisis. And led to the complete reordering of the US political economy. One manifestation of that reordering is a massive drop in inequality, which reflects the emergence of the welfare state and so on. And the argument last year was that perhaps we're pushing towards uh, a similar fate uh, in the present, where the ruling class is uh, pushing against, against the, again against the limits of its own power with uh, nearly 50% of the income going to the top 10%. And if, if that process uh, continues, then we might end up in another form of creordering of the political economy. Now, the next uh, chart uses the income inequality, so you can see it in red. That's a thin line in red, so that's from the previous chart. That's the share of the uh, income going to the top 10% of the population. The thick black line shows you the correctional population. So these are people uh, in prison, jail, on parole, and on probation as a share of the total population. And the first thing we see is the uh, very tight correlation between these two measures. So as the uh, ruling class pushes towards its asymptotes of power, it has to inflict more and more damage on the underlying population. And one form of that damage is the incarceration or punishment or correction of the lower strata of society that end up in um, some facility or under supervision. Uh, 
so we see this massive correlation. We also see that the uh, share of the correctional population in the total has reached uh, some sort of a peak recently of about 2.5%. So 2.5 people of every 10 people, of every uh, 100 people in the US are actually corrected. Uh, and we see that this situation is somehow representing uh, a vibration in the mind of the ruling class, perhaps as evident by the fact that the Supreme Court is uh, demanding to release some of these people because this situation, perhaps in their mind, is really explosive. So are we heading towards some sort of a reversal? Is this the beginning of that uh, process? So what I'd like to do today is examine some of the history of violence related uh, to this process. And in the next figure, what I do is I take the correctional population and I plot it at the bottom. So again, I'm carrying it from the previous chart. But on the top, I'm showing the rate of change of that correctional population. So each observation is the percent change from the previous year. For example, in the 1940s, uh, early 40s, you see that the correctional population as a share of the total fell by about 10%. And in uh, the late 1980s, it rose by about 10%. So that's more or less the kind of the uh, boundaries of variations. And the questions that I'd like to ask uh, is what explains the history of this type of uh, state violence? And I mean state in the broader sense of the state uh, as a mode of power. Uh, why is it that until the middle of the 1970s, the correctional population remained fairly stable? And then why is it that it soared and went vertical? And what caused it recently to level off? Uh, now, until the 1930s, uh, this question was never asked, this type of question. Uh, and certainly, it was never asked, answered. Uh, the people who dealt with crime and punishment were not political economists. They were novelists, they were legal experts, they were doctors and psychologists, uh, philosophers, moralists. Uh, political economists didn't touch this subject in any meaningful way. The first person to actually uh, make it uh, a subject of inquiry was uh, a German political economist by the name of uh, Georg uh, Rusche. Now, uh, a little bit of a biographical sketch, because I suspect most of you do not know this name. And in a moment, you'll understand why. Uh, he was born in 1900. And he got his PhD in the early uh, 1920s. And he was very interested in labor markets. And he also did uh, prison work. And that dual interest led him to the hypothesis that the two subjects are perhaps correlated in a meaningful way. Uh, in the early 1930s, he was commissioned by the Frankfurt School to uh, write a book on the subject. In 1933, he produced a short article that set up his project and laid out his hypothesis and his uh, major findings. Uh, it took him another six years to uh, finish uh, the book, which was co-authored with uh, somebody else. Uh, it's called Punishment and Social Structure. And there are many stories in between those two periods of what happened to the book and uh, kind of uh, the turbulent uh, gestation period that led to it. Uh, in this work, uh, Rusche argues that basically crime and punishment are too important to be left out of political economy. Uh, they have to be anchored in uh, economic theory first. So that's the economic part. Uh, they have to be anchored in the class struggle. So that's the political aspect. And they have to be historicized. So they have to be studied as an evolutionary process. And he asked himself, what might be the initial propositions that one would have to make in order to start investigating that subject. And he came out with four general propositions, which I'm going to list briefly. Uh, the first proposition, and some of these propositions may sound to us quite trivial, if not liberal today. But remember, this is the 1930s. Uh, and Ruscha is the first person to write about it. And uh, he's writing in the Marxian uh, materialist tradition. So the considerations are very materialistic. Uh, he argues first, uh, or makes a proposition about the purpose of punishment. So crime, he says, 
essentially are act, consists of acts that are uh, forbidden by society. So uh, the obvious purpose of uh, punishment, at least one purpose, is to deter people from committing those crimes. Secondly, he moves to the, uh, what we can call the Bentham-like uh, calculus of pleasure and pain. What does it take to deter people from committing crime? Uh, well, you make uh, them uh, understand that crime doesn't pay. So if you are uh, an economist today, you would say that you have to impress on them that the expected pain from committing the crime is likely to be greater than the expected gain from committing the crime. Uh, the third proposition uh, is something we'd like to think of the, as the asymptotes of penality. Uh, what kind of pain you should inflict on those who commit crime? Well, most of those who are uh, susceptible to crime uh, in terms of committing it uh, are those who live at the bottom of society because the living conditions at the bottom of society uh, make crime sometimes a necessity. So in order to deter very poor people from committing crime, you have to make sure that the penal sanction is worse than the lowest living conditions at the lowest parts of society. Uh, in the words of Bernard Shaw, and I'm kind of paraphrasing it from memory, if the prison does not outbid the slum in terms of living condition, then the slum will empty and the prison will fill. So that must really set the highest living conditions in the prison or the best conditions in the penal system should be worse than the lowest living conditions in society. So that's the third proposition about the asymptotes of penality. And finally, the question is, what determines the conditions of life at the lower strata of society? And Ruscha says many things. But if we are to focus on the most important one, it is the labor market. It is essentially the situation in terms of the excess supply and excess demand for labor, or what we call unemployment. When there is too much labor being offered and unemployment is high, obviously there will be more crime and also conditions are harsher, so the penal sanction should be harsher. And vice versa when labor conditions improve. Now this sets, in a way, the boundaries for analysis for Ruscha. He says there are two extreme situations. One situation is of massive excess supply. For example, in China, when he writes. So in China, there is a uh, you know, huge number of, of people who are actually available to work at almost no cost. Under those circumstances, where the living conditions are very, very close to kind of uh, physical necessity, uh, the only way to deter them from crime is to actually kill them. So execution is rampant and is a, a sort of a matter of course in China of the 19, say, 20 and 30s. Now the other extreme is massive excess demand for labor, where labor is very, very scarce, workers are needed. Uh, this example, uh, for instance, uh, occurred in 17th century Europe under mercantilism, and this is a period where we see penal reform. And it's also a period where we see uh, forced labor, that the uh, power that be actually force people uh, to work by imprisoning people and actually making them work under supervision. So that's uh, sort of the two boundaries that we should uh, examine. Uh, one boundary is execution, the other is reform. And the purpose of the theory, according to Ruscha, is to actually examine the history of uh, the class struggle that actually fleshes out the analytical structure historically to study what the Israeli call the two nations of the rich and the poor and Marx called the class struggle. So what, he, what Ruscha is doing essentially is to look at different epochs in history and examine the, the labor market conditions in those epochs, examine the nature of crime in those epochs and examine the nature of punishment. So let me go very quickly through uh, some of the examples that he gives. 
He starts from the early Middle Ages. And in the early Middle Ages, there is plenty of land and there is very little population. So labor, in that sense, is scarce. And most crime is crime of passion rather than crime of property. And the form of pun punishment is uh, first by revenge, uh, secondly by penance, and thirdly by fines. If you move to the late Middle Ages, the situation inverts. So we have actually uh, land becoming more scarce and labor becoming more abandoned. We see the multiplication of armies of beggars roaming Europe. And we have much more property crime, and we have a lot of robbery on the highways. And this is a period in which punishment grows uh, crueler. Uh, if you move to the mercantilist period, beginning in the, say, 17th century, we see again a reversal. We see excess demand for labor because the population is reduced because of various conflicts and plagues. At the same time, the trade increases the demand for labor. Uh, crime abates, and for the first time, we have the Enlightenment actually open the door, opening the door for a more form of, a more humane form of reform. We see imprisonment being institutionalized as a way of punishing people. And we see the beginning of systematic forced labor. When you move to the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, we see again the situation reversing. Because of uh, the uh, rapid mechanization, labor occasionally becomes very abundant. And we see the multiplication of what Marx calls the reserve army of the unemployed. Crime is rising and punishment uh, becomes de Dickensian, uh, very cruel. Uh, if you move to the uh, 19th century in the United States, again, the situation reverses. You have massive industrialization. You have a lot of land. And you have an influx of uh, migrant population, but it's not sufficient to reduce the scarcity of labor. So we have low crime. And we have, again, in the United States, prison reform in full swing. Um, we have the experimentation, for example, with conditional sentencing. Uh, or we have the experimentation with parole and probation during that time. Uh, we also have science for the first time investigating what is it that causes crime and how can we use, perhaps, welfare reforms to abate it. Uh, Russia also engaged in interesting speculation on the difference between Germany and the United States during the 1930s. Uh, and the difference has to do with the strength of the labor unions. During the Depression, uh, the labor unions in the United States are fairly weak. And as a result of that, standards of living are lower. And the result of that is that conditions in the uh, penal system are very harsh compared to Germany where uh, labor unions were much stronger than in the United States. A final observation from his work uh, is that he is one of the first to speculate on the forthcoming concentration camp. He argues that uh, in totalitarian regimes where uh, the purpose is armament and you need a lot of labor that is not available, you are going to engage in forced labor. And that is one of the purposes, certainly not the, the most important one, but one of the purposes of the concentration camps that the Nazis uh, later on uh, used. Now, uh, Rusch's work for his time was mind-boggling. It was very innovative, uh, and his empirical, historical exploration was uh, impressive, to say the least. Nonetheless, for a long time, he was obscure and completely unknown. Uh, he had no impact on criminology, no impact on sociology, on the mainstream of it, certainly, and uh, almost no impact whatsoever on political economy. The recognition of Russia uh, started only in the late 70s and early 1980s. And the main reason, I think, had to do with the uh, growing uh, intensification and rise of crime and punishment in the United States. So a lot of critical uh, sociologists and radical criminologists suddenly became interested in Russia because he was anchoring this rise in crime and conditions of the labor market. And also, we have the beginning of uh, more systematic data and cheap computing that allow scientific study of the connection between the labor market and the penal system. So here we have critical sociologists and radical criminologists uh, jumping into 
uh, this kind of literature and trying to subject his uh, thesis uh, to empirical investigation and theoretical exploration. Now, in general, uh, the long-term propositions of Rouge turn out to be very informative and very fruitful in generating derivative hypotheses uh, and derivative theories, but his short-term or the short-term analysis built on his uh, insights was less impressive. And, and the next chart shows why. Uh, here we look at the, the United States. Uh, can you still see it? Yeah? It's clear enough? All right. So this is the United States, all my data for the United States because this is just uh, uh, an initial exploration. Uh, you see the rate of unemployment in red uh, against the left-hand scale, and you see the correctional population against the right-hand scale. So this is following Rouche's suggestion that labor market is characterized by uh, the rate of unemployment and the tendency of criminologists and sociologists to think of penality as measured by the extent of punishment. So that's the proportion of the correctional population in the overall population. Now what we see is up until the early 1980s, it seems that Rouge's hypothesis stands up pretty neatly. It, uh, the rate of unemployment and uh, the correctional population are positively correlated, not extremely tightly, but still positively correlated. But this correlation breaks down more or less completely from the 80, 1980s onwards. With the rise of neoliberalism, we see unemployment declining, at least until the early 2000s, but the correctional population zooms. And the argument that you read in uh, a lot of the critical and radical uh, criminologist literature and soci sociology about the subject is that uh, perhaps this is not enough to explain what is going on. The rate of unemployment and what happens in the labor market is insufficient. Uh, and maybe Ruscha was right in some respect, but he needs to be uh, fine-tuned and it needs to be made more subtle and you know, all those expressions, we need specificity, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Uh, I would argue that this would be a very hasty conclusion to draw and uh, maybe it reflects uh, badly more on the criminologist and sociologist than on Ruscha. And I think that the problem is, how do you measure penality, really? Uh, the standard approach is to measure it without much thinking by the number of people that are under correction, and I think this is wrong. And the reason is as follows. At any point in time, the level of the correctional population is affected by two factors. It's affected by the deep history. So it is affected by past crime and past punishment that put people in jail and under correction. And it is affected also by what happens this year. So by how much the correctional population increased because more people were put into jail and prison and, and under pr parole and probation, uh, as well as how many people were released. So there are two components. There's a historical component, and there is a current component. And at any point in time, penality is affected by the second component, not by the two components. So I would argue that if you are to look at unemployment as a factor that affects penality, that unemployment affects the rate of growth of the correctional population rather than the level of the correctional population. And when we shift the emphasis from levels to rates of growth, the picture changes quite radically, and that's what you see in the next chart. So this chart uses the same rate of unemployment, but it uses the rate of growth of the correctional population. And what we see is that there is no longer any need for complex models. You don't need numerous variables and multiple regressions. Uh, you don't need really excuses to explain why your theory doesn't work and add up all sorts of dummy variables and qualitative analysis and this and that. It seems as if Ruscha was very right. He was more right than he could ever imagine, I think, uh, with two possible exceptions which I come to in a moment. So for most of the period, we see penality and the labor market being really two mirror images of one another. The two forms of sabotage, unemployment and penality, are just 
two sides of the same reality. The exceptions. We see that in the 1930s, the first systemic crisis, and presently, the next systemic crisis, the disrelationship breaks down. So unemployment zooms, but penality measured by the rate of growth of the correctional population as a share of the total actually declines. So this is the, not the thing you would expect uh, if you accept Rouge's proposition. So this is sort of a, a puzzle that we need to think about. Now, how do we think about this puzzle? In order to do that, the next stage is to kind of take the rate of growth of the correctional population out of the total and decompose it and ask what determines that rate of growth. So that I do with these equations. I know some people here don't like mathematics, but here uh, I'm using the most simple mathematics. And if you're not sure, you can uh, ask me later or ask your uh, you know, fellow mathematician. Uh, essentially, in mathematics, uh, you use the symbol of a dot sometimes over the variable to indicate the rate of growth of the variable. So equation one shows you the correctional population as a share of the overall population expressed as a rate of growth. So by how much it grows in a particular time period, say a year. Now, mathematically, if you, I think if you take uh, calculus one, you will learn that this is approximately equal to the rate of growth of the numerator less the great rate of growth of the denominator. So the rate of growth of this ratio is the rate of growth of the correctional population itself less the rate of growth of the overall population. Now, making another simplifying assumption, if the overall population grows by a fairly stable rate, most of the fluctuation in the correctional population as a share of the total will be explained by the fluctuations in the correctional population itself. Because this doesn't fluctuate much, but this fluctuates a lot. And therefore, much of the fluctuations here will be determined by what happens here. So I'm focusing now only on the correctional population. If you look at the rate of growth of the correctional population, uh, it is equal to the change in the correctional population between two years over the level of the correctional population. That's the standard way of measuring a rate of growth. And then I'm decomposing it further by adding and by multiplying and dividing by variables. So if you look at this line of the equation, you can see clearly that crime here and crime here cancel out. And overall population here and overall population here will cancel out. So eventually, you will end up with a change of the correctional population over the correctional population, which is the original equation. But in this kind of decomposition, uh, we end up with useful information because we have meaningful explanation for the variables. The first variable here, the change in the correctional population over crime, is, in my opinion, measuring the intensity of punishment. And we will explain that later on. The second one measures the crime rate. How many crimes are there per person in the population? And the third one is the inversion of this ratio. It's the overall population over the correctional population. So all in all, we have here the result, which says that the rate of growth of the correctional population is made of three factors, the intensity of punishment, the crime rate, and again, the ratio of the correctional population to the overall correctional population, which is our history. I'm going to focus on the first two in the, nu in the numerator, and we'll show you what happened to them historically. So the first one is the crime rate. And I'm focusing here on what the FBI calls the serious crime rate. What is the serious crime rate? The serious crime rate comprises murder, rape, aggravated assault, robbery, and various forms of theft. Not embezzlement, but you know, uh, kind of lower forms of theft. Now, you take that and you express it as a proportion of the population, you get the serious crime rate. For example, in the early 1980, the serious crime rate was about 600 per 10,000 people. So that's about 6%. So for every 100 people, there were about six crimes. You see that it's a cyclical ratio. It started from about 2% in the 60s. It rose to about 6% 80s, 90s. And then it dropped back to half its level 
in the 80s. At that time, criminologists were kind of shouting, uh, the end is nigh. The United States is disintegrating. They were projecting crime to continue and rise. It didn't happen. Uh, in fact, it went down. So there you are for the ability to predict. In a moment, we'll see why they couldn't see it. Uh, now, we don't have data going before 1960, but we do have data for murder, for the murder rate. And the murder rate is, of course, not the same order of magnitude. For example, here you see that the murder rate projected to the right is only one murder per 10,000 people as opposed to 600 serious crimes. So the order of magnitude is actually quite different, but the two are highly correlated. So if that correlation existed prior to 1960, we can see a very stylized, long-term cyclical pattern of crime in the United States. All right. Now, we move now to the intensity of punishment. So what I do here is I draw the crime rate from the previous chart on the left-hand scale. And uh, again, the difference between this chart and the previous one is that this is expressed out of 100 people rather than 10,000. But the shape of the movement is the same. And then I'll explain to you what the intensity of punishment means. If you look back on the equation, you'll see that the intensity of punishment is measured in two steps. The first step is to figure out the net change between one year and the previous year and the number of people who are defined as correctional. So you take the correctional population, say, in 2010, subtract from it the correctional population in 2009. And what you get in this case is negative 157,000. So the correction population actually fell by 157,000. That means that the number of people that were added to the correction population was smaller from the number of people that were uh, released by 157,000. You divide then in the second stage this by the number of crimes. So what you get here in this number is minus 0.1.5. Sorry, minus 1.5. And that means that for every uh, 100 crimes, there was 1.5 uh, persons released from the correctional population. Of course, the number doesn't have to be negative. Uh, here, in the 1998, the number was three. So for every 100 crimes, there were three people added to the correctional population. And uh, this measure is a, a synthetic measure. What does it express? It expresses uh, the uh, zeal and effectiveness of the police in catching criminals. It expresses the legal code that tells the legal system who can be punished. It expresses the harshness of the uh, uh, court system. So that's the entry point. And it also expresses what happened in the past in terms of how many people are released from the correctional population. So it's a synthetic measure, and it's all per crime. So it tells you per crime what is the intensity of punishment in this particular year. Now what we see here is something very interesting. We see a very tight correlation between these two components of penality. We see a very tight correlation between the number of crimes per, per population and the intensity of punishment per crime, which is quite consistent with Ruscha's argument that whatever the cause of crime, it affects both crime and punishment in the same way. Because it doesn't have to be that way. They could be inversely correlated rather than positively correlated. So it tells us that if unemployment indeed is something that moves crime and punishment, uh, this is almost, almost a sort of a, a hypothesis ready to prove. So let's try to look at the connection between each of these measures and unemployment in the United States. The next chart shows the relationship between serious crime and unemployment. And we see that the co connection holds. We see an increase in unemployment and crime up until the early 80s and a decline thereafter. And we also see this puzzle that I indicated before, that unemployment zooms uh, around the latter part of the 2000, but 
serious crime continues to decline. So the puzzle still remains at the level of crime. Then if we move to the level of the intensity of punishment, we see a similar correlation. We see uh, unemployment correlated to the intensity of punishment up until the early 80s in a positive way, and again in a positive way on the decline. This is the period of the beginning of neoliberalism, but still unemployment declines. Punishment, the severity of punishment actually lessens. Again, with the exception of the last few years in which the relationship seems to break down completely. All right. So we have this two interesting propositions. Usually a connection. We don't have data, remember, for years prior to 1960, but we can speculate. Uh, but from 1960 onwards, we see Russia's argument standing up until the systemic crisis. So what do we make of this? What are the implications that uh, Shimshon and I draw from these tentative inquiries uh, about capital as power and the limits of capital as power? Uh, so let me, let me just kind of trace back the argument uh, so far. We started with the notion that uh, the current crisis is a systemic crisis. Uh, we have systemic fear on the part of the ruling class, perhaps indicated by uh, what happens with the Supreme Court uh, ruling on releasing uh, prisoners as an example of systemic fear. Then we move to the asymptotes of power, and we are trying to establish that the power has some objective limits, and the ruling class is pushing towards those objective limits. The ruling class has no choice but to push towards those limits. Why? Because accumulation means imposition of power. If you are to accumulate more, especially differentially, you have to impose more pain, uh, more penalty, more punishment on the population. So the ruling class has no choice but to push towards those limits. Uh, then we move to the darker side. The darker side meaning the side of resistance. And I mentioned that in the past, we thought of resistance as associated with production because we're thinking about capitalism as a system of production. So strikes, demonstrations, mobilization. Then came the 1970s, 1980s, uh, with characters like Derrida and others uh, who introduced you know, the postist analysis in which uh, ethnicity uh, and uh, uh, racism and questions like that come into the fore. Uh, this is uh, an explicitly anti-deterministic, anti-socialist, anti-enlightenment position that turns the analysis of penality, uh, of course, Foucault, uh, into a subjective inquiry. Uh, it's uh, breaking loose of its deterministic ties, but it's also breaking loose of its meaning. In other words, we lose a sense of meaning of what that actually means. What we are trying to do is to uh, basically uh, make determinism, again, a respectable scientific approach. Uh, resistance here is not autonomous resistance. Crime is not autonomous resistance. Crime is a reaction to capital as power. It is not an autonomous movement to liberate us from capital as power. Uh, and this reaction to capitalist power is part of the logic of capital. And I think that in order to understand that connection, we have to change the frame of reference. Instead of thinking of capital as uh, a form of production or related to production and capitalism as a mode of production, uh, we need to think about it differently. So unemployment is not about economics, just as penalty is not about state and the legal system. Instead, if you think about, uh, sorry, let me backtrack. Ruscha basically tries to mediate that bifurcation by saying, let's link the two. Let's actually think of penalty and unemployment as being interrelated. But he's still anchored in the uh, neo-Marxism of the monopoly capital school that came around that time. Uh, or emerge around that time with Michael Kaletsky, and he's still thinking of these two things as influencing one another. If you think from the perspective of uh, capitalism as a mode of power, then we are not thinking about economics and politics. We are thinking of two forms of sabotage. Creativity is a positive form of resisting capital. 
Uh, unemployment is the capitalist way of sabotaging creativity, of subjugating creativity to capitalist ends. So creativity is the positive side. Uh, illegality is the negative uh, resistance, if you like, to capitalism. And penality is the way that capitalists contain this illegal resistance. Uh, now, if you think about it in those two terms, then we are thinking, essentially, of discounting two forms of resistance and two forms of retaliation against resistance. One is legal and creative. The other is legal, illegal, and destructive. I think this kind of a, a system of thinking might actually, although we didn't uh, spell it out completely, might be consistent with our notion of regimes of differential accumulation. So we spoke of depth and breadth. And during uh, the depth phase, two minutes, yeah, we'll take uh, three or four. Uh, We've, we've talked about the depth phase as being uh, energized by sabotage in the form of stagflation. So in the depth phase, capitalists are accumulating through crisis and they engage in uh, aggressive form of sabotage, inflation plus stagnation or unemployment. Uh, and here we have an additional form of sabotage, and that's penality. Uh, we see it rising together with depth up until the 1980s and declining afterwards in the breath phase. So this is a potential for expanding this in the future in terms of another form of sabotage among many others. Now we're still left with the enigma, and this is for the last two minutes. We're still left with the enigma of what happens All right, what happens in the 1930s and what happens presently? That uh, the two forms of sabotage do not uh, coincide with one another. Instead of being highly correlated, they become uh, inversely correlated. There are three possible explanations. And uh, I will just outline those explanations as the conclusion of my presentation. The first form of explanation is that the data are wrong or inaccurate uh, either in the way we presented them or in the way that they are collated. And it's entirely possible because we, don't, we are not uh, um, uh, dealing here with uh, economic data. We are dealing here with legal data that could be actually uh, quite complicated to standardize. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that this presentation is simply too crude, that we're missing things that are very, very important, say, in the labor market, and they're not captured by the a rough rate of unemployment, and therefore we see that uh, kind of uh, uh, breakdown of the model where, where, in fact, there is no breakdown. So that's another possibility. But there's also a third possibility that is much more substantive, and I have no idea if it is correct or not, but I suspect that there must be uh, something uh, to it. And that is that a systemic crisis actually changes the rules of the game. So. Crisis during the period, say, from the 40s till the 2000s are regular crises, but systemic crises do something that is quite different. And you know, under normal circumstances, many uh, among the poor basically have no way out. That's why we call this no way out. Uh, they have no jobs, or they have no prospects for job. N equally important, they lose their dignity. And therefore, they became, become very alienated from the society in which they live. And their reaction is an individualistic reaction of defiance of the system. And that's manifesting itself in the form of crime. However, in a systemic crisis, for the first time in a long period of time, we know of two systemic crises in capitalism, there is the possibility of a political alternative. And that possibility is a possibility not of defiance, but of solidarity. So both people in the middle class and the no lower middle class realize that they're not middle class. They're not really in the middle of anything. They are powerless. And the people really at the bottom of society also realize that they have something in common with the rest of the population. There is a possibility, an imagination of solidarity. And under those circumstances, defiance might actually give room to thinking about reforming the system or perhaps changing it altogether. 
And that is a possibility that might explain why crime actually declines. So it's not just the uncertainty and the fear of the ruling class that, that tries to alleviate the conditions in the jails in order for uh, the situation not to become explosive. It's also the question of the underlying population and the bottom of it realizing perhaps there is an alternative to just resign from the system, but actually change it, perhaps altogether. Thank you. OK, um, the floor is open to questions, please, to the two lecturers. Anybody? <laughs> yeah, there's one. Uh, who's handling the microphone? Uh, Jeff, Jeff Powell from SOAS. Um, my question is for, for Jonathan. Thank you for a, a, a really stimulating um, paper. Um, t two questions. I wasn't clear why you made this. You talked early on about differences between crimes of passion and, and material crimes. And then in the data, you kind of moved to using serious crime, which seems to kind of be a mix of the two as I, as I read how the FBI defines their serious crime in, in one of your, your footnotes. Um, is, is there any way to look at, would something different be happening if we were trying to look at more traditional material crimes that excluded uh, more violent crime or what would look like crimes of passion? And then the other is, and this relates to, I mean, you, 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 you um, pulled all the rabbits out of your own hat. You, you, you've already suggested all the things that could be pointed out. But just to, to specify one of them, uh, and maybe we've got some labor economists in, in the room or, or labor specialists, particularly in the US, but as I understand, there's been significant changes in the definition of unemployment in the US since sort of Reagan times on at least three different occasions. And accompanying of that, of course, is a general acceptance of increasing precarity of employment, even for those who are employed. And, and how might that affect the argument? So I was just very surprised to see you know, US unemployment so to, to be so steadily declining from 1980 in the neoliberal period, is there something else going, going on there? So really just small questions of, of, of empirical nature. Thank you. A couple of points, um, Dr. Nitsen. There's it's interesting, um, these anomalies in the, 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 the pattern that you've identified. One thing that I thought was a little bit interesting, just I know from my um, research into Newfoundland during the times of the Depression, um, the state ran out of money completely until 1933 when it was basically transformed again into a crown colony when it came to Newfoundland. So there was absolutely no administrative capacity to put people in prisons. So I wonder if that might have anything to do with that anomaly there. Was there a loss of administrative capacity for actually the execution of crime punishment that could be linked to the systemic crisis that you see so clearly in the unemployment numbers? That's just one simple possibility. But the other thing I want to just add to your research and this um, other, other research agendas on this issue is that is there not some type of problem that's seen after t the year 2000 as well where conditions in jail are not necessarily worse than the outside world, but in fact there's a reverse psychology where people cannot function without the institutional code of the penal system. And there's a lot of evidence showing that there are a lot of individuals who cannot cope outside of the institution precisely because of child protection laws that, that gradually became implemented within societies that saw the penalization of children at a younger age through foster care, et cetera, um, the penalization of youth within different societies. So I don't know if that might be another research question to add to the agenda there. There's another question here. Oh, oh. sorry. 
Maybe we share some of uh, our first, and then we take you two in the next one. Well, uh, many things. Harald Wolf, Göttingen, Germany. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the close, very interesting contributions. Uh, uh, I'm wondering a bit uh, if the title of the session is fitting uh, that book, uh, Power from Above and Power from Below. Um, uh, after same aims for, as, as uh, the society, but uh, uses illegal means. And um, I think Yeah, I think we take these three and then we make another round, okay? All right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, all right. Uh, the first question about separating the different uh, crimes, yes, you can. Uh, in fact, uh, the FBI uh, breaks it down by type of crime, so you can get the number of uh, you know, murders and, and rapes and so on and so forth, so you can break it down. Uh, the thing is that, for example, the number of murders uh, is not going to make any meaningful uh, change to the overall crime rate if you dedu deduct it because it's marginally so small in numerical terms. So I look at the overall measure, and as, as I suggested, uh, this is a very preliminary type of inqui inquiry. It is not the... Uh, Final statement is just an initial opening statement. So sure, all of those things can be done, and we haven't done them. Uh, the second question about unemployment, sure, it can be uh, redefined in many ways. For example, you can measure the average duration of unemployment, how much or how long people are out of work. If they're unemployed, then you can combine that with the level of unemployment, and you get different numbers. The fluctuation will be the same. but. Uh, uh, but the level will be different, and sometimes there will be kind of uh, shifts in the direction to some extent. So again, we haven't tried it. What we try to do is offer 
the most rudimentary, the, the, the simplest possible examination rather than the most complex. We wanted to get away from complexity and to try to figure out if we can distill something that tells us uh, we can subject this to, to deterministic analysis and get something out of it without a lot of uh, whistles and bells. And I think that something quite meaningful comes out of it without having to go into further details. But of course, further details are absolutely necessary. And I hope that you know, uh, people are going to write PhDs on the subject. Uh, about Lori Ahn's question, uh, whether the uh, uh, state uh, was running out of money and capacity to lock up uh, people, perhaps. Again, this is a question I don't know the answer to, but what we do know is that the murder rate actually declined during the Great Depression. So at least the crime rate uh, was going down. It wasn't going up. So uh, I don't know about the rate of incarceration per crime. So again, this is a question to, to explore further empirically. Uh, in terms of the conditions in jail, that they are possibly better now inside the walls than outside the walls, entirely possible, but crime is actually falling. It's not rising. So you know you would expect under the circumstances people to engage in more crime in the hope that A, they will gain something from breaking the law, and if they don't, they end up in jail, which is you know, uh, a vacation. Uh, this is not happening, and punishment is not intensifying as well. So I think it's still consistent with, with Rusha to some extent. Uh, about the outside and inside, I will leave that question to you. In terms of uh, crime uh, not being resistance, I'm not sure I actually accept it. I don't think it's autonomous resistance. I think it's automatic resistance. I think it is a reaction uh, and a pretty predictable reaction, as you can see here in the chart. Uh, and you know, it comes out in novels, whether you read the true story of the Kelly Gang in Australia in, in the 19th century, or you read The Godfather, or you read the Siberian education about the uh, you know, Russian mafia and so on, uh, you see how much this is uh, s part of the, of the regime. So they say the war in, in, uh, war in, in Russia is, is an antithesis to the centralized power. It's an antithesis to the state. The one thing you can never do if you are uh, uh, part of the Russian mafia is actually speak to an official, whether that official is a czarist official or a communist official. Once it is official, you negate that official. You don't speak to officials. So it's always a reaction to power. Uh, you read The Godfather, it's a reaction to power, but it's a creation of another form of power, for sure. But I, I, I think it is not autonomous resistance, but it certainly is resistance to power, although it might actually create its own form of power. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for your comment. Um, it's interesting to think about. Um, I can't give you necessarily a, a clear answer, but I do conceptualize uh, capital as a mode of power. And it's founded, whether we want to call it outside or not, uh, on an exclusion. So no ownership, no kind of exclusive rights to own and uh, disable those who don't, right? Uh, no accumulation. So. It's the 1% is intimately related with the quote unquote 99% if we want to use those terms or the 0.02% of people who are um, these high net worth individuals who have $1 million minimum in investable assets. By definition, they're the, they're the owners, right? Uh, they're intimately related with us, but they're in, in the sense of accumulation. Um, but from kind of a spatial standpoint, a standpoint of built environment, their social networks, all those things, even their economy, the goods and services that they are able to consume, uh, they're worlds apart. Their psychology is not our psychology. They're inventing now new diseases for these people who, you know, I think it's called sudden wealth syndrome, where, you know, all of a sudden you, you wake up the next day because you've had a liquidity event on the stock market and you're Mark Zuckerberg, and you've got $25 billion or whatever, uh, and you go into crisis because now you don't know, you know <laughs> how to fulfill your life goals because you've got everything now, something like this. So, um, and that's the interesting thing is on that living extremely well index, uh, there's actually the cost of a psychologist on the Upper uh, East Side of Manhattan. So it's in the index itself that these rich people, the extremely wealthy people, are going to have to see, are likely going to see a psychologist in their time. It's in the basket of goods on the index. It's craziness. 
So I think we have to come to believe, those of us who aren't in that class, that their world is not our world. Absolutely not. You know. Okay. So. <clears throat> I'll just make uh, uh, two comments rather than questions. On, on the first uh, case, I mean, I think Brodel was probably right. Yeah. But it is a question of degree. Okay. Uh, and that is extremely important, and that's, in fact, expressed in those charts. Mm. And then the second, uh, behind all of this, I see the ghost of a crisis of capitalism. Uh, and frankly, I'm not, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced by the fact that they are so fearful, or that they've reached uh, unequal extremes, or that there is a systemic, a possible systemic crisis. You see, you mentioned Abramovich. Now, Abramovich gets on the media and he says, I was created a billionaire. Yeah. I did not become a billionaire. billionaire. I was created a billionaire by the reward of state assets, mm. right? Yeah. Now, that wasn't very long ago. But where is there a political movement which said it should not be taken away from him? Mm -hmm. That's right. Absolutely. There, I see nothing in the political movement of a confiscatory socialism type, or even of a confiscatory movement. You talk about the chief executive officers, oh yes, we should reduce their salary. But what about the accumulation they have for the past five years? Mm. Yeah. There, there, there is, and so I'm not convinced that, that there is a, a fear in, in that way. And, and I think uh, that brings me to the other comment about um, uh, the solidarity case. I think that's wishful thinking. <laughs> I do really not see any evidence that uh, in this particular case it, that, that there is a solidarity developing because of this systemic crisis of capitalism, which I have difficulty with. If you look at the 1930s, they were right. They were right then, because immediately from 1945 onwards, there were changes in their favor. So you're, if you argue that when the rate of unemployment departs from uh, the correctional population in the 1930s, I would argue, yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. There could have been a solidarity. They saw that there was a, mm. you can imagine, I mean, to a certain extent, I lived through it. They do talk about a new era, confiscatory socialism, uh, uh, you know, e equality and so on and so forth, and they were right. Mm -hmm. Here, I don't see it. I think it might more well be, and I don't want to go into that, but the, the reasons, I, I don't, the reasons for the increase after 1960 and the decline now might well be more that the ruling class, as you say, have really now convince themselves they have a control of the underclass and they don't need these any more expensive options of putting them in jail. Mm. Is there another? Uh, yeah, this is a, um, I guess, kind of a point of clarification um, for uh, Tim. Yeah. Uh, kind of a, I guess, kind of a, a technical question about your uh, term differential conspicuous consumption. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to get my uh, to wrap my head around it because it seems that when Veblen comes up with the term conspicuous consumption, it's already in a sense a relational concept, right? So for Veblen, consumption isn't this kind of singular thing with me and an object. It's me consuming that object in relation to everyone else. Yeah. So already it seems to lend itself to the fact that the top zero, not the top one percent, but you're talking about the real one percent. Mm -hmm they're already conspicuously consuming because they're already buying things that I or anyone in this room could never even dream of seeing. And right. we'll never see these people, right? <laughs> Likely they're, not, no. Yeah, we're not gonna see them at the, at the same store. No. But then it seems, <laughs> but it seems that when you add the word differential conspicuous consumption, yeah. it, I'm, st I'm still trying to wrap my head around the decision to add the term differential because it seems to suggest that someone is trying to conspicuously consume at a rate faster than someone else. So if I'm in the top 0001%, I'm trying to actually buy more stuff or consume more stuff at a faster rate than other people. And I'm trying to wrap my head around that because I don't know if, I can't really find an example of where that applies because you brought up uh, kind of the change from yachts to submarines. Yeah. 
to me, that's something that you can't really go too far ahead of yourself. You can't be really the only one buying a yacht. It seems to be still kind of a, a herd mentality, uh, sorry, a submarine. It still seems to be kind of a, a shift yeah. of kind of a collective shift of a lot of people, maybe not a lot of people in the rest of the world, but it's still a group of people that are buying submarines. Mm -hmm. So I'm still trying to wonder what was the kind of impulse to add differential to that concept? Yeah, I suppose this wasn't made clear, and I take the point uh, fully. But I think, and I haven't done enough research on this, like I said, this was really kind of preliminary, um, that the rich actually do operate with benchmarks, not only for their investments, but for the consumptive practices. So I'll give you an example. To get your boat on the Forbes, you know, not your boat, your yacht, on the Forbes 100 list uh, in 1990, you had to have a minimum of 147,000 feet, right? Uh, by today's standard, you will not make it on the list, your yacht will not make it on the list without 250 feet minimum. You know, So there is this kind of competition that's ongoing. And Abramovich has the biggest yacht now and the most expensive. But uh, give it two more years, and there'll be another yacht that's got an extra 50 feet, maybe another swimming pool, you know, two submarines on it, so on and so forth. This is at least from reading how to spend it and a number of these other kind of exclusive websites and so on and so forth, um, this seems to be the case. So I mean, you know, uh, this $2 billion home, give it a couple of years, there'll be a $4 billion home, I'm guessing. So there's always these benchmarks, hard to identify for me, um, and I haven't done any systematic research on it, but I, even though I take the point, I'd like the term. <laughs> So we'll see, but yeah. Uh, sorry, there was one uh, other question, and I would then s say that we make a last uh, commentary on, on Jeffreys and, and that one, and then we have a 1% dinner for the 1% <laughs> in the know of how capital works. Yeah, so after that comment, I actually talked to both, both professors quite frequently, so I'll make my questions as short as possible. For you, Professor, and it's, it's sort of a two-parter. I'm gonna make it as brief as possible, but where does, where does race or systemic racism fit into this, right? Mm. Because you, you label out that unemployment is, is really close connected to uh, being in prison, but what about racism, right? And I'm just thinking, you know, it, it doesn't take much to go back into history a little bit to look at that, like sort of sort that out. But, uh, and then for you, uh, Professor uh, DiMuzio, um, I'm thinking like going back to Rockefeller type billionaires where they actually made a lot of actually public like invested a lot of money in the public infrastructure right like Rockefeller said like his best investment was funding his institute I do believe to sort of University like build his yeah. yeah so I was just wondering is your book or your potential book or your potential idea going to look at sort of the building of uh, political ideology and I'm just thinking like the coach brothers with the tea party specifically yeah um John Oh, we're going to take a few more? No, I'm, I'm, I'm. You want to go ahead? Yeah, all right. You can take one or two more. No, let, let, we, we have two, so. Okay. Uh, uh, about Jeffrey's comment that uh, you don't see systemic fear and you don't see really a reason for systemic fear. Uh, I mean, we usually cannot debate those things very effectively uh, ex ante. We can debate them ex, ex post. So uh, I don't know if uh, we lived in 1929, we would uh, be conclusively uh, saying that there's systemic fear and systemic crisis. Uh, I think that it first appears not in the form of demonstrations and so on. It appears in the form of a, of a financial crash, which, which is kind of forward-looking anticipation of what is going to happen. And then, if it pans out as a real crisis, then it will. And if not, then the market might actually bounce back. So I think we haven't seen the end of it to actually uh, draw more informed conclusions. I think that the uh, ruling class is struck by systemic fear uh, from different indication that, that we have presented uh, last, the year before, sorry, in 2010. Uh, but I agree with you that we do not see uh, systemic resistance, it's certainly not autonomous systemic resistance that is going to make the ruling class very fearful. I think that we have a complexity problem now rather than a, a, a one of a, a sort of conscious uh, resistance. So we have, uh, say, ecological problems that are very serious. We have all sorts of problems of the complexity of 
of uh, capitalism that actually frightened the ruling class no more than the resistance, just the ability to hold it together. It's like in the Soviet Union, everything was working nice and dandy, but it <laughs> collapsed, and then all of a sudden it was obvious that it was sort of a, some sort of a, of a class conflict. But up until that point, it was a problem of being completely unable to manage that system. It was a question of a complete breakdown of informational system, of, of theoretical uh, understanding of what is going on, and so on. So I think it's pretty complex, but I, I agree with you that, uh, uh, at least personally, I don't have uh, a complete answer or even a confident tentative answer to that question. I just sense that it, it, it is there, but I cannot substantiate it by more than the uh, dilemmas that I see, by uh, the antinomies that I see, by some of the measures that I see. So that's uh, my partial answer to your question. Uh, in terms of racism, uh, sure, I mean, you can introduce anything you like into the analysis. The question is, is it necessary? For example, in this case, we see that penalty is associated with unemployment. You don't need anything else. So it could be that unemployment and racism are connected together, or penalty is connected also with racism. But the question is, how do you feed in that additional variable when you actually don't need it, statistically. So there, there is a theoretical question there that is much more complex than what we have presented here. You know, would you argue that it's just a question of race in the United States, or maybe race is part of that uh, structure that has to do with the labor market, and because black and uh, people of color are actually uh, at the lower strata of society, mm -hmm. then they tend to be the criminals. Is it because of race? Well, that's a much more complicated question. So I, I do not have a full answer to your question, but that, of course, has to do with the simplicity of the model that I'm presenting. I was trying to replicate something that was generated in the 1930s, deemed to be uh, incorrect, thrown out of the window. In fact, it is quite powerful as a starting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Matt, for sure, definitely. I'm um, looking at the history of, of wealth uh, and luxury. Brodel's a great start in that sense, the structures of everyday life, um, up to you know the big capitalist Rockefeller is obviously the first billionaire on the planet, uh, and these robber barons uh, essentially do spend a lot on public goods, just like a number of the wealthy do today. Um, from preliminary research, it's actually surprising how much, though, that the uber wealthy do not spend. Uh, as a proportion of their entire kind of net worth on philanthropy and charities and so on. Well, that's true. Yeah, absolutely. But um, again, uh, it's not giving it away. Do you know what I mean? So, well, we don't know if he is or not. I'm, I haven't looked into it too much, but yeah. So that's part of the project. OK, thank you again to the uh, presentations. And uh, I think <laughs> we deserve uh, a long day, to right? eat, a, eat something today. And Great. Cheers. Thank you.